need to first acknowledge that much of the world's attention currently has steered away from Saudi Arabia's human rights record. And this is why we are here to shed light again. And in, that, in light of uh, this lack of attention, uh, we know that this leads to further impunity uh, on a lot of things, on freedom of expression, on the death penalty, on women's rights. Uh, so it's very important to keep shedding light uh, on continuing abuses and to take action on them. Uh, and on that, uh, I want to start with the issue of executions, where it's been over two months now since Saudi Arabia executed 81 people in one day. And as of today, the total number of people executed in the country is 120. This rampage of executions is not new. But what's unprecedented about it is its scale, and particularly in the mass execution that happened in March. The accusations that people faced um, who were executed in March uh, were wide-ranging uh, because they were tried for so many different reasons, yet lumped together in one terrorism-related case, and that's how their execution was announced. Um, some of the charges they faced include murder, armed robbery, uh, armed smuggling, uh, and vague terrorism charges uh, for others. Uh, it's worth noting that a number of those executed were also convicted of charges such as participating in sit-ins uh, or inciting on uh, sit-ins and protests. Uh, which are issues that should not even be criminalized. These are issues that should not be uh, in a charge sheet in the, in the first place. Uh, out of the 81 cases uh, of people who were executed in March, uh, we've reviewed cases of two individuals, and I'd like to highlight uh, a few issues that come up uh, in such cases, um, including uh, in the trials of these people. Uh, two of the people, actually 41 out of the 81, so half of the people who were executed were from Saudi Arabia's Shia minority. And uh, we've reviewed cases of two of these people and their court uh, proceedings, and they fall far short of international standards. And this is not only in death penalty cases, such as the cases of the two people we've reviewed their cases, uh, but these shortcomings uh, are applicable in many other cases of freedom of expression. What's particularly detrimental about the cases of executions is that the death penalty is an irreversible punishment. There is no way to remedy uh, anyone to change uh, the sentence once it's final and once it's been ratified by the king. However, in case after case, we see courts uh, insisting on making final sentences that were passed down uh, after people said that they were tortured to confess, that these confessions, uh, that they prefer that these confessions are withdrawn, uh, that they want the court to investigate violations in their uh, interrogation, violations in their pre-trial detention, uh, and throughout their trial, uh, the lack of uh, legal representation, uh, them not being able to prepare a defense or give an adequate time to prepare for their defense, uh, the lack of transparency throughout the trial is all raised uh, during court proceedings and is ignored in case after case. And unfortunately, we have seen that this has been the case in cases of people who were executed in March. And this continues to this, to this day in all other cases. Uh, one of the most striking failures of the judicial system in such cases is not investigating these confessions that were extracted through torture and not investigating the testimonies uh, of individuals and how they've, they've given these confessions. Um, I want to highlight here another uh, case um, in relation to the death penalty. It's, it's, we have dozens more cases of people under death row. And in some instances, uh, the charges that they face um, are, should not be criminalized in the first place. And in one case, uh, 
there is an academic whose name is Hassan al-Maliki, and he's currently at risk of execution. He's not yet on death row, uh, yet uh, his trial session keeps getting postponed. His loved ones have been waiting to know his fate for years, uh, and month after month, they're promised uh, a conviction and a trial session, yet that doesn't happen. So um, in addition to the violations to his rights um, in his trial, uh, his family is also facing the emotional burden and heaviness of waiting to know the fate of their loved one. Uh, in the case of Hassan Maliki, um, he was tried and continues to be tried before the counter-terror court. Uh, his charges are absolutely outrageous. They are things that we should not be reading in a court document, like possessing unauthorized books, publishing his writings outside of Saudi Arabia, conducting media interviews with Western newspapers and channels. So they're all in relation to extremely normal activities that we all do every day. Uh, yet the prosecution demanded his execution and we fear in light of the lack of action uh, or conviction from courts that he might be uh, sentenced to death at any moment once the court schedules a session. The death penalty is not a standalone issue. Like we see in the case of uh, the academic Hassan Maliki, it relates to a lot of other violations that people face and it perpetuates other violations and how it's applied in Saudi Arabia. And this can only happen in, in, under a deeply flawed justice system. Uh, while the death penalty is one lethal tool within the range, a range of other tools that the Saudi authorities have used to crush people's rights and silence people, uh, it's, it's not the only tool. Uh, we've seen that the Saudi authorities have promised several legislative reforms, and most prominently there are things that uh, do have an impact on how the death penalty is being applied, such as the penal code on discretionary sentences. Uh, it's not been uh, ratified or published yet, but it's been promised uh, since last year, and we're still waiting uh, for it to be published to be able to properly assess it. But we do question under which circumstances these reforms and laws are being uh, published when there is no civil society to consult with, uh, when people who are experts on issues, uh, including lawyers, political scientists, uh, and academics of various backgrounds are not given the opportunity to participate in the drafting and the consultation on such laws, uh, and when civil society in general is just being crushed. So unfortunately, the reality of the situation today is far from us being able to celebrate reforms or legal uh, uh, laws, uh, changing changes to laws easily, because the context in which they're happening in is uh, an extremely, um, it, it's with an, extre an extreme, uh, uh, yeah, uh, extreme uh, fear and fear of speaking out by activists and people who uh, would alternatively uh, input into such reforms. Uh, their participation, the participation of civil society is very important before we can celebrate any, uh, anything that can have an impact on human rights. Uh, I will end it here and uh, I'd be happy to discuss anything in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana, uh, especially for, for keeping to time with four speakers in an hour. That's uh, very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, I'll pass it now to, uh, to Rafna Begum from uh, Human Rights Watch. Thank you. Thank Where's you yours? so much. And uh, thank you to all the people today. Um, so just in, on top of what uh, Dana was talking about, I want to sort of refer to, we couldn't, we felt it was really important to talk about, um, when we're talking about the situation for, for human rights in Saudi Arabia, that we needed to discuss the so-called reforms that we're seeing coming out in this country, particularly the illusory nature of such reforms. As many of you know, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has used women's rights in particular to really prop himself up as a reformer. But the truth is that these reforms have been 
you know, really come about following decades of activism by women's rights activists, but the changes themselves are quite limited. So since 2018, Saudi women can now drive. Since 2019, women over the age of 21, like men, can now obtain their own passports and travel abroad without a male guardian's permission. Women can also register their children's birth, and they now have protections against employment discrimination and sexual harassment. So these are no small feats, but they are still highly limited. We find that the male guardianship system as a whole remains intact. Saudi women still require male guardians approval to marry, to be released from prison or obtain certain sexual and reproductive health care. Men can still file cases against their daughters, wives or female relatives for disobedience, which can lead to their forceful return home. Women are still detained in shelters when they are deemed to have transgressed so-called rules or where their families have abandoned them or even when they flee family abuse and they cannot leave without their male guardian's permission or unless they marry someone who can act as their new guardian. While we're seeing a lot of new jobs opening up for women, there is still significantly high unemployment for them. Earlier this year, it was reported that for just 30 train, dra train driver jobs, more than 28,000 women applied. Even when the law has changed, the authorities are doing little to tackle discrimination they face in practice. So for instance, the 2013 Saudi Regulations on Domestic Violence still provides that it is only deemed abuse where the guardian goes beyond their limits of guardianship. One of the biggest issues is that the space to push for reforms remains limited and difficult to enforce. The authorities crack down on women's rights activists, arresting, torturing, and trying them in unfair trials, which they did at the same time as allowing women to drive, has had a chilling effect. Last year, the authorities released, released the remaining women activists from prison, but with suspended jail sentences and lengthy travel bans that mean women cannot take up activism again in the same way. We're seeing that Saudi female journalists and local media outlets once used to discuss issues affecting women. Now, local outlets only post positive headlines about them. A couple of years ago, there were local articles referring to women now being allowed to open bank accounts. But this was not an actually an issue before. And other times, the stories are just given a positive spin. In March this year, there was a big uh, announcement of a law being passed. This was the family law codified for the very first time, a call that Saudi women's rights activists have been demanding for decades. But they were not allowed to be able to comment on the draft, nor was the draft law made public. The new law has some important provisions, such as setting a minimum age of 18 for women to marry for the first time. However, as feared, the law actually codifies much of the discrimination that women have faced in practice when it comes to marriage, divorce, decisions over their children and inheritance. So for instance, while there is a minimum age of marriage, the law still allows courts to approve marriages below 18 with no minimum age for such exceptions. Women also now under the law require male guardian permission to marry while men do not, and they can marry up to four women at any one time. Women under the law are also required to obey their husbands. The Saudi authorities are also considering codifying their penal code for the very first time. No draft like the family law has been made public and people are not able to comment on this incredible um, new thing that's about to happen. And the authorities could end up codifying their practice of arresting and charging people for private consensual relations, such as Khilwa, which was the meeting of unrelated men and women alone, for zina, uh, the uh, crime of extramarital sex, for sorcery and witchcraft, abortion, and other acts relating to expression of non-conforming gender identity or sexual orientation. Now, criminalizing these activities not only contravenes international standards and the charges themselves are applied in a manner that actually discriminates against women. The charges can be used to prosecute victims of sexual violence or trafficking. For instance, we have seen how pregnancy has been used as an evidence of zina offenses and women who have reported rape or sexual violence have been deemed to have confessed to sex and prosecuted instead. Some of these offenses also carry corporal punishment sentences like floggings and stonings. 
So these are the things that we need to be on the lookout for when such a law comes, to, comes into play. Lastly, without the space for women to make such demands and raise public awareness, we will see very little change in the actual reality for women and the reforms themselves will quickly run dry. I wanna take a quick turn to talk about migrant workers, another huge population in the country. There's some 10 million migrant workers who work in Saudi Arabia, who make up 80% of the workforce. And they live and work under the abusive immigration system known as kafala. The kafala system ties migrant workers' legal status to their employer, facilitating abuse and exploitation, including forced labor, trafficking, and slavery-like conditions. The thing to note is that Saudi Arabia has one of the most restrictive kafala systems in the region as it retains all of the abusive elements. After we saw some neighboring countries like Qatar and the United Arab Emirates began to make some reforms to their kafala system, in March 2021, the Saudi authorities introduced labor reforms that eased some restrictions and allowed some migrant workers to change jobs without employee consent under very narrow circumstances. The reforms themselves do not go far enough to dismantle the abusive kafala system. They do two main things. One, they allow migrant workers to request an exit permit without the employer's permission for the very first time, but they do not abolish the exit permit itself, which contravenes international human rights law, as everyone has the right to leave any country. Migrant workers, secondly, can now change jobs without their current employer's consent after completing one year of their contract or once their contract expires. However, they can still face absconding penalties, and this is far too limited for many workers who face abuse. One of the biggest issues is that these reforms do not include migrant workers that are not covered by the labor law. So farmers and over 3.7 million migrant domestic workers who are among the least protected and most vulnerable to abuse cannot um, apply for such uh, reforms. Domestic workers in particular face serious abuses, including wage theft, long working hours without a day off, passport confiscations, and on top of all of that, they can face forced confinement, isolation, and physical and sexual abuse. But they are denied all protections afforded to those governed by the labor law, including the newly introduced reforms. And I want to end by saying that when we're talking about these reforms that we're seeing coming out of Saudi Arabia, it's incredibly important to have real objective accountability for them, to find out if they actually are real reforms or actually existing practice, if the reforms themselves are good or bad, none of which we can really assess without information being able to come out of the country, which means that we need a civic space for activists to be able to report on what, what is going on. It is really important that diplomats keep the Saudi Arabia on its agenda and establish regular monitoring and reporting on its human rights situation. Without this, we will not, we will only hear what the Saudi authorities want us to hear on their so-called reforms. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rokna. Um, I'll now pass the floor to, uh, 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 sorry. I'll now, sorry, I'll now pass the floor to uh, Lena, um, uh, who, uh, who will speak on behalf of Focus. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So first, one of the first things that should be noticed on this panel is that none of the panelists are inside Saudi Arabia. And this isn't a coincidence. In fact, since Crown Prince Hamad bin Salman came to power in 2017, Saudi society has witnessed an unprecedented crackdown on the already highly restricted right to freedom of opinion and expression. Waves of arrests have targeted hundreds of human rights defenders, women's rights activists, journalists, academics, lawyers, religious figures, businessmen, and even members of the royal family. Including anyone critical of the authorities or even simply fa failing to make a public profession of loyalty to the regime. The creation of the Saudi state security in 2017 and the misuse of the anti terrorism and cybercrime laws have turned the country into a police state where basic freedoms are heavily sanctioned. <laughs> 
It is, however, important to note that we have noticed a significant difference when Saudi Arabia is under scrutiny. In fact, as Saudi Arabia was hosting the G20 in 2020, international attention focused on the authorities' violations for a while. But as the spotlight faded, the Saudi authorities reverted to their habitual pattern of repression with fresh waves of arbitrary arrests and deliberate attempts to endanger the lives of prisoners of conscience. Rights activists and critiques of the Saudi authorities continue to be tried and sentenced as part of a renewed crackdown on peaceful activism and the exercise of fundamental rights. In April 2021, for example, Abdurrahman al a humanitarian a humanitarian aid worker was sentenced to 20 years in prison and the following 20 years travel ban after being forcibly disappeared for more than two years over satirical tweets. With so many prominent figures already behind bars, recent arrests tended to target younger and lesser known individuals. In May 2021, dozens of young online activists were arrested over tweets as well. Abdullah Jilan had just graduated in the US and couldn't find a job. He started tweeting about unemployment and social issues in Saudi. He has been arrested over his online activism and his fate remains unknown until this day. Lina Sharif, a medical doctor, was arrested for speaking about the human rights situation in Saudi Arabia. She celebrated her 34th birthday behind bars last week. And these are only a few examples amongst countless prisoners of conscience. Moreover, the repression does not only target those who dare speak, it goes even further, as relatives of prisoners of conscience who inquire about their loved ones can be arrested as well. Sliman al dwesh is a Saudi preacher who has been under enforced disappearance since 2018. His sons have been arrested for inquiring about their father. One of them, Abdul Rahman, was transferred to Malaz prison in 2021, following two weeks of intensive care after be, being ill in solitary confinement. Abdul Rahman had been forcibly disappeared since October 2021, and in November of that year, he was put on trial behind closed doors without his family knowledge and without his lawyer present. He was sentenced to two years. Behind bars, prisoners of conscience continue to face cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment for which they have no access to legal recourse. Deliberate medical and administrative neglect has also led to a number of deaths and detention in recent years. Most recently of political reformer Musa al-Qarni in October 2021. Witnesses reported that al-Qarni had been beaten around the head and face with a sharp object, resulting in facial injuries and fractures to, to his skull. Al-Qarni had been moved to a cell with takfiri extremists, complained to prison offic officials, was ignored, and was subsequently murdered. While a number of high-profile prisoners of conscience have now been conditionally released, all remain subject to severe restrictions that are imposed as silencing mechanisms. The most common one that has become a pattern are travel bans, both on released prisoners of conscience and on their families. And this is the case of my sister Lujain al Hadlul and my whole family in Saudi Arabia. And as all the ones under a travel ban, they live in a state of constant fear of potential arrest. In such a context, Self-censorship becomes the norm and has a chilling effect on other freedoms, such as the freedom of assembly and association. And this has allowed Saudi authorities to undertake other internationally sanctioned crime with all impunity and without any possibility for people to dissent and those who take the risk can be heavily sanctioned. In fact, Saudi authorities have forcibly uprooted local communities and demolished people's houses to make way for Neom, in northern Saudi Arabia and other megacity projects in Jeddah. Thousands have protested their relocation, but authorities have responded with extreme violence, even going so far as to execute a Saudi citizen, Abdul Rahim al-Hwaiti, who refused to leave. <laughs> 
Many of his relatives are now in prison for ex expressing their solidarity. One of them has been sentenced to 16 years in prison for publicly expressing his anger. Um, many more subjects can be mentioned regarding Saudi Arabia's hu human rights record, but I'd just like to conclude by reaffirming that the level of international attention on the Saudi authorities does have a big impact on the situation on the ground. We therefore urge all inter international observers and policymakers to further enhance their scrutiny over Saudi Arabia's human rights abuses and to keep human rights at the core of every interaction with the Saudi authorities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lina. Um, I'll now pass the floor to my colleague, Claire, uh, who will speak about uh, the Patterns of Torture Report and, and associated topics. Thank you, Michael. So in my presentation, I propose to cover two related issues. First is the custodial torture of human rights defenders with impunity in Saudi Arabia. And second is the international community's complicity in allowing this culture of impunity to thrive. So as Michael mentioned, in December 2021, the Gulf Center for Human Rights published an extensive report analyzing the main patterns of torture in Saudi Arabia. And one clear pattern that emerged was the symbiotic relationship between the arbitrary detention and torture of human rights defenders and the oppressive system of governance in Saudi Arabia. In particular, torture as a means of extracting confessions, which are then frequently used as admissible evidence in grossly unfair trials, has become an intrinsic part of the Saudi justice system. The widespread problem of custodial torture in Saudi Arabia was also highlighted by the UN Committee Against Torture in its conclusions during the last review in 2016. In recent years, despite the promises of reform mentioned by my fellow panellists, the authorities have only further strengthened their ability to arbitrarily arrest and torture human rights defenders. As very aptly stated by the former UN Special Rapporteur for Torture, Ben Emerson QC, following his visit to Saudi Arabia back in 2017, the theoretical protections enshrined in law appear illusory in practice. And this has been achieved by the creation of a new security apparatus in 2017 called the Presidency of State Security, which, is which assembles counter-terrorism and domestic intelligence services all under one roof. And 2017 also saw the enactment of counter-terrorism legislation which empowers the public prosecutor to prohibit lawyers from communicating with terror suspects at any time during the investigation. And the 2017 law also violates international norms on the length of time that suspects can be held without charge and allows the specialised criminal court to hear secret witnesses and expert testimonies without providing the defence with any opportunity to cross-examine. And our research and reporting at the Gulf Centre shows that the handing down of vague terrorism related charges in a justice system entirely lacking in legal safeguards and due process is almost always a prelude to arbitrary detention and torture. To give but one example amongst many, the case of Abdul Rahman al Sadan, as already referred to by Lina, is highly illustrative of these patterns of torture. al Sadan, who is an aid worker, was arrested in March 2018 from the Red Crescent Society office in Riyadh and detained without charge for almost three years, during which time he was entirely removed from the outside world and subjected to torture and ill treatment, including electric shocks, beatings, flogging, suspension in stress positions, sleep deprivation, death threats, insults, verbal humiliations and solitary confinement. Furthermore, in what is a very common practice in Saudi Arabia, as already mentioned by Dana, prosecutors forced him to sign confessions relating to his use of social media and to criticise and where he criticised the government, um, and they forced him to do this while he was blindfolded and under threat. Following his trial in 2021, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison, followed by a 20-year travel ban on charges that included funding and supporting terrorism. Turning now to the issue of impunity. When a detainee decides to courageously speak up about torture suffered in detention, these allegations are invariably discarded. 
The extreme culture of impunity that reigns in Saudi Arabia can be summed up by the ongoing detention of Saudi human rights defender Khalid Al-Omar in retaliation against his decision to file a complaint against an intelligence officer who allegedly tortured him. But instead of conducting thorough and independent investigations into such serious human rights abuses and allegations you know, as anyone would expect, the approach of the Saudi authorities is to pile abuse upon abuse by punishing torture survivors who seek justice and accountability. It should be clear by now that accountability and justice for torture survivors are elusive concepts in Saudi Arabia. But it is important to stress that impunity is not just a domestic problem that happens in a vacuum, but also a product of international complicity. Firstly, this complicity with other countries with similarly dismal human rights records in perpetrating human rights abuses. For example, following a campaign of targeted digital surveillance at the behest of the United Arab Emirates, Hussein al Hatloul was arbitrarily arrested by the EU UAE security services and forcibly returned to Saudi Arabia, where she was detained and tortured. So when we discuss impunity, we really have to widen our focus beyond the domestic laws and mechanisms, while that is, of course, important, but to also pinpoint the countries that are supporting, supporting and sheltering one another in committing grave human rights violations. Second, the complicity of cyber surveillance companies in allowing authoritarian governments to hack and spy on peaceful human rights defenders violates the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, which place an obligation on companies to engage in human rights due diligence and corporate social responsibility when selling and exporting technology to countries with poor human rights records. The lawsuit filed by Lujain al Hatloul in a US district court in Oregon against three former US intelligence and military officers who have admitted in a US court to helping carrying out hacking operations on behalf of the UAE is an important example how this, of how this could be achieved. A global moratorium on the sale, transfer and licensing of spyware until robust human rights compliant regulations on the use of such technology are implemented are also essential. And we would therefore take the opportunity to reiterate last year's warning from a group of UN special rapporteurs and experts that a failure to do so would allow this sector to operate as a human rights free zone. Third, business as usual approaches to Saudi Arabia continue to help perpetrate the abuses. Essentially, they rubber stamp them. And to give an example, in September 2021, the Guardian revealed that six nations, including Saudi Arabia, were invited by the British government to Europe's biggest arms fair in London. In continuing in such a manner to nurture diplomatic and, eco and economic ties with Saudi Arabia, particularly in the arms trade, whilst turning a blind eye to the systematic torture and other grave human rights violations perpetrated against peaceful human rights defenders and dissenting voices, the international community is in fact complicit in the perpetration of these crimes. In short, empty words that are unaccompanied by concrete actions are frankly of no use. So what to do? Universal jurisdiction is one way of ensuring accountability for the perpetration of torture in circumstances where justice would otherwise elude victims. This has recently been demonstrated in a historic first victory in Germany for international efforts to bring legal accountability for atrocities, including torture, which were committed during the war in Syria. In April 2021, the Gulf Centre for Human Rights filed an official, official complaint with the prosecutor's office in Paris against Saudi Major General Ahmed Hassan Mohammed al Mohammed al Asiri for the torture per perpetrated against Jamal Hashaji in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in October 2018. The case will seek to hold Asiri accountable for his alleged role in organising and planning Hashaji's torture and assassination. And we would encourage to fulfil their obligations to prosecute perpetrators of torture using universal jurisdiction. And finally, to conclude, I would echo my fellow panellists' calls for the Human Rights Council to monitor and report on violations in Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire, and, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, I will encourage anyone who uh, wishes to ask a question to just uh, put their name in the chat and then I'll call on you to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to ask your question or you, can, uh, or you can write it in the chat. 
uh, states are particularly encouraged to, to, to ask any questions. Um, before we, just, sorry, I'm just looking at the chat here. Um, so uh, while we're while we're waiting, um, I'm I'm just going to ask a question to our to our uh, to our panelists, and any of them can can choose to jump in. Um, what do you think would be perhaps some of the, the more effective ways that the Human Rights Council uh, could uh, could uh, could take action to uh, to address some of the, the human rights concerns that we've heard about today? I'll just uh, any, anyone that wants to answer, please please jump in. I'll come in, um, Michael, if, if no one else wants to, just to kick things off. So I think the calls that we have asked for for monitoring and reporting are really essential because over the past few years, you know, as my colleagues already mentioned, there has been this increasing lack of attention, but accompanied by a deteriorating situation, particularly since 2017. So what we're seeing is, at least from within Saudi Arabia, you know, as Lena rightly pointed out, none of us are there, um, and for good reason. It's very difficult and more and more difficult to get that information. Um, the last you know, visit by a special rapporteur um, on torture was in 2017. And even back then, Ben Emerson you know, was fed with this reformist, reformist narrative. You know, we've seen a lack of engagement as well in terms of um, complying with the reporting standards with the Committee Against Torture, the obligation to reply state, to supply state reports in a timely fashion um, as further evidence of that disengagement. And then we're looking at this broader context of international complicity, as I've alluded to in my presentation. And, you know, we're looking at more and more risks and we need to look at these things in a joined up fashion. And one major alert that we have had as well over the past few months has been the election of Al Raisi, um, a, U a United Arab Emirates general to the presidency of Interpol. And so we're looking potentially going forward at greater cooperation in organisations that should be actually supporting um, you know, international fights against crime, organized crime. We're looking at abuses of those systems and you know, friendly countries to each other, such as the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia coming together to cooperate more in that. And so what we need to do as an international community and what the Human Rights Council needs to consider doing um, is upping the reporting and monitoring to combat this lack of engagement, um, complete withdrawal in some regards from reporting mechanisms, but then the accompanying international uh, support um, that we're seeing from countries like United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia to each other. So they would be the main points I, I would raise in relation to why this mechanism is important. Can I add to that if that's okay? So I absolutely agree that the reporting mechanism is absolutely crucial. I would also add that when making recommendations to Saudi Arabia to really incorporate the civic space when we're talking about reforms. So when you're talking about, you know, the codifier, penal code for the first time, or do, you know, so-and-so include recommendations that say, you know, in consultation with human rights activists, you know, release those activists, you know, ensure that travel bans are lifted and so on. Without that civic space, what we're seeing is a total drive to what is now, what, Saudi Arabia is basically looking like it's going to become the United Arab Emirates. The UAE is an incredibly repressive country, which has a very effective PR strategy and has been quite successful in that regard. And it has no free human rights defender right now. Saudi Arabia is a very different country. It is a much bigger Saudi population. A citizen population is far, far bigger than the Emirati, Emirati society. And it is a much richer history in its own kind of activism, decades of which, right? And so it's really quite concerning that Saudi Arabia is looking to become the new UAE in this respect. And it's doing quite well in, in the sense that we're seeing lots of countries feeling very reluctant to complain when they're seeing some reforms in women's rights and so on, and willing to accept whatever narrative is coming out. But it will be crucial to make sure that if we don't preserve what little exists of that civic space and make sure that civic space becomes bigger, and so every time we have a recommendation, every time there's a government meeting with the Saudi Arabian authorities, you have to raise the issues of the human rights defenders and what exists and what doesn't exist. Um, because we, we are completely seeing that closure of that space. 
And that would be incredibly helpful. The other thing to be aware of is every time you see a reform, question whether it is a real reform. That means go to those who are, you know, the activists like Lina who exist outside Arabia to find out if it is a real reform or not, before you go ahead and acknowledge or welcome those, those so-called reforms, or to find out how limited they may be so you can hold them to account. Um, just to be aware, you know, when we talk about even migrant workers, the, the kafala reforms were not done with in trade unions internationally, what, there were no local trade unions internally, um, it was announced without any work with international labor organization, they're doing whatever they want uh, with very little work really, um, but to get the same kind of uh, um, accolades really as, as other countries have done, but we have worked much harder than Saudi Arabia has done. So I think just being really aware of that when you were sort of making recommendations would be great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Great. I want to just add something which is also linked to Emily Belson's uh, question. I think what's uh, really important as well is, well, we have to know that families take a big risk when they share information about, you know, relatives being arrested uh, or in prison, tortured. And I think it's important for the Human Rights Council and anyone who has leverage uh, over Saudi Arabia to name these people, to show Saudi Arabia that even though they're trying their best to hide all these abuses, even though there is no transparency at all, information is going to be leaked and people will know about it. So, um, and then when Saudi knows that, you know, the information will be leaked in, in any way, um, they might they may reduce some of their abuses and may, you know, at least, you know, not to torture as, um, as yeah, regularly as, um, as they, they, they are uh, when they know that no one is watching. And it's also linked to maybe Emily Wilson's question. Um, the thing is, what, what should be known, the Saudi government as it is now is very different from the, 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 the regimes we've had before. Hamad, when Hamad bin Salman came to power, he had no legitimacy at all, not within the royal family. He did a coup, and no one calls it as such, but it is a coup. Uh, he imprisoned the, the ones who, who might, you know, dissent against him being in power. The people didn't choose him, and the only thing he has is the international community accepting him. And for the international community to accept him, he had to have the right narrative to be accepted including talking about women's rights, you know, which is um, something that the West likes to, to hear of, uh, you know, including, you know, opening up concerts, etc. So the, without this narrative, it wouldn't have been possible for him to be... Can I go on? We can't hear you, Michael. You're muted, Michael. Uh, my apologies. We we decided that it would be good to let everyone see each other while speaking, but we know there's a risk of of disruption. And uh, I actually uh, I, I think it's a sign that these meetings are unwelcome and considered a threat. So I'd like to just thank everybody for for patience and uh, and uh, just maybe to let us reflect on the fact that these meetings are worth our time if uh, if they're worth disrupting. So uh, thank you very much. And Lena, please please continue. <laughs> Of course. So yes, I was just saying that you know the the the, the only thing that makes the Saudi government uh, you know able to 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 stay um, and to continue with their abuses is that um, they pretend to be open and not uh, do anything. You know, it's not like, and I, I know it's very difficult to have this comparison, but Iran doesn't really care about you know the, the their image. So it's of course different the way that we have to deal with Iran than we deal with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has only its image and they want to show that they're, they're not abusing, that they're opening up. So given this fact, uh, we the, the, the West has leverage saying, look, we know what you're, you're doing. You're not, uh, you're not actually that open. And, you know, we, we won't believe any of uh, your, your narratives or your um, reforms uh, if, you know, prisoners of conscience are not uh, released, if, you know, we're not allowed to speak to the activists, is there, uh, if there is no civ civic space at all. So yes, the, the only thing that is lacking is legitimacy and the legitimacy comes from the West. So if the West you know, takes this leverage to pressure Saudi into uh, releasing human rights activists and so on, um, it, it will work. There, there is a lot to be done and the, the West has a lot of le leverage over Saudi these days. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Lena. You alluded to the question in the chat from Emily Belson. Uh, I'll just read it out uh, and give uh, the other panelists a chance to, to provide input. Uh, thank you so much for your time. A couple of the panelists mentioned that a heightened level of international attention on Saudi authorities has a significant effect on the situation on the ground in KSA. Would you be able to discuss this a bit further? So I'll open that up to any of the other panelists who would like to, uh, who would like to add something. Oh, Rafna, I think you're on mute. Did it work? Okay. I'm on mute now. It wasn't allowing us to unmute. Um, so thank you. Sorry, um, so I just want to flag that, yes, absolutely. I just want to reiterate what Lena has just talked about, which is that the heightened um, intention from the international community is effective, particularly under this current authorities, uh, under the authority of Mohammed bin Salman. This is different to the Saudi authorities of 10, 15 years ago, where there was a lot more of an internal focus of you know, what they were doing. So which is part of the reason why we saw very little in terms of women's rights reforming, next to nothing really. Um, and so, you know, they, when they did come through with reforms, it was with sustained action by women's rights activists and other people really calling on change. And then, you know, we, with the international community going on and on about it, but it took years really for before some of these things really would come about and would, you would see change. Now what we're seeing is a very different kind of reality, which is that the Saudi uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is invested in that external image, very invested. And so the kinds of reforms we're seeing is totally about the international community. So for instance, just to give you an example, when they announced for women to drive, they didn't do it inside the country. They did it at the embassy and at the, you know, at the UN in New York. You know, they were looking to do it in DC and New York. That's their audience. So their announcement was completely geared for the international community, not for the locals, or not, not the locals in their own country. And you have to see those reforms in that way. When we talk about the local media outlets only spinning positive women's rights stories, that's also because they're hoping it will get picked up in the international media outlets. You know, why would you have a story about women can open bank accounts now when women have been able to open bank accounts? I mean, local women would have known that and wouldn't have cared about it. But that was just to see if they can continue to have this flow of women's rights positive stories that international media app will pick up and then that will just spin a whole round of some great things happening in Saudi Arabia, right? So we have to do all the work of saying this is not true, it's not actually the way it's happening and so on. But we're also quite limited because we're not getting the information from within the country about the extent of how bad things are for women. Right. So that was also becoming quite limited. And, you know, it's a lot more work now to really figure out what is going on. And even then we have to now, you know, there's there's always been security issues, but this is this is much more extreme than it ever was. I, I do really I don't think people quite truly understand, you know, things were so bad inside Arabia before, you know, protests were never allowed. You're not allowed to join a trade union. You're not allowed to strike. There were no independent human rights organizations you know, that were registered. But there were human rights activists, there were lots of people who made calls and were, you know, in some ways there was a sort of civic space, a very limited one, but one that did exist. Now that doesn't exist anymore. And I don't, I'm not sure if it's quite understood how bad that is and what that means for the reality of both citizens and residents in the country and what this means when it goes, comes going forward. Um, so, I mean, the one good thing, I suppose, is if, because he cares so much about his international image, is that you then, as diplomats, have much more power than you once did before. And that means you are now in a sense of responsibility to make sure that you're not conceding to any reform that they said that they're coming out with, but making sure that that civic space, that is really championed, you know, really checking about those travel bans, who's under them, who's not under them, what level of surveillance is now being used in civil society, even if they are free, what does that mean? Assessing whether or not people are freely able to talk about things in a critical way as a means of monitoring as to whether or not the Saudi authorities, you know, not just whether or not they're doing well on something, but whether or not there is even criticism. If we're not seeing criticism, that should be a flag of concern. Seeing just positive stories is not a good thing. We need to be seeing an extensive debate within local media outlets, within society, if that's not happening, we should be raising concerns about it. Thanks. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Lena. Did you want to add? Uh, did you want to add something? Okay. Thank you. you. Um, 
Yes, I absolutely uh, agree with everything Ratna just said, and maybe just a personal story um, to illustrate all of this. When my sister was arrested, she was forcibly disappeared for almost a year. She didn't have charges. And even before having charges, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman had an interview with the Western outlet. And he was saying himself, the Crown Prince was saying that Lujain was a traitor and that he had videos of her being a traitor that he could show the day after the interview. Of course, we've never seen these videos, but what's even more important to, to, to note is that the charges have nothing to do with her being a traitor and they're explicitly about her being an activist. Um, and we actually uh, published everything on a website if anyone is interested, uh, the, the whole, you know, the, all the official documents are published. It's lujainalahdrul.com. And, um, and you can see that just to scare, to, to scare the population inside of Saudi Arabia to make it explicit that being an activist is being a terrorist nowadays, they, 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 they have it this way. But outside with Western media, they would say that she's a, she's a traitor, that she's a terrorist. So we see there, you know, a double, um, yeah, a double narrative inside Saudi Arabia where it's hyper nationalism, you know, everything that's critical is being a traitor. And, uh, you know, the narrative that they give to, um, to, to the West and, you know, to, to, to the international community of being open and, um, and, and basically changing. But what is really changing is that the country is becoming a pure police state that we've, uh, we've never had be before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lena. I don't see any uh, further questions, and I do realize we're coming up to the top of the hour. So I just want to make a few concluding points. Uh, first of all, thank you to all the, the speakers for, for bringing uh, very interesting information from, from widely different perspectives and, and issues. Um, I, I'd like to thank the participants for showing up in, in large numbers, and it's, it's very good to see so many, uh, so many missions and, and states represented. I just want to make three points. Um, you know, the, 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 the murder of Jamal Khashoggi took attention to a, to a high point um, and, and pressure to a high point, and this caused some changes, but we've seen that now wane. Uh, and, and, but what the, the lesson to perhaps remember from that is, as, as has been stated by, by Lena lastly, is pressure does work. Uh, pressure is is effective and uh, the, the Human Rights Council is, is one place where pressure can be applied, which basically brings me to my third point, which is that we, we call on the Human Rights Council, we call on the states on the, on, on the Human Rights Council to push for monitoring and reporting uh, in, in, in whatever form that, that uh, they see fit uh, in a way that will continue to keep the spotlight on, on Saudi Arabia uh, so that so that improvements can can be pushed for. So I uh, I just I want to make the those final comments and I will uh, uh, unless there is a last burning question or somebody would like to add something I will uh, I will close the meeting uh, and speakers are of course welcome to stay for a moment after. <laughs>